few people marry knowing how to love. And I know that because I counsel your marriages. Few. This is the mission, April, that I'm trying to get you and your husband to see must function in your home. But I'm also going to be showing you all the different factors that make it difficult for the mission to be carried out in your home. The pastor, I thought your subject was the marriage of Adam and Eve. It sure is. I'm letting you see what in one bite of fruit the devil destroyed. Hello and welcome. We're glad that you have decided to join us by downloading and listening to this week's featured message. Our sermon for the week is presented by Pastor Henry Wright and entitled, The Marriage of Adam and Eve, Part 1. We trust that this week's message will truly be a blessing and inspiration to you while you listen. Our theme for the years 2005 and 2006 has been Christ's Commission, My Mission. And we began in 2005 focusing on the importance of the mission itself. And then we talked about that mission as unfolded in the books of Daniel and Revelation, particularly at our first service dealing with the book of Daniel. Then we lifted the love aspect of the mission in the book of Revelation. But starting today in the morning service and last week in the second service, I'm now shifting the emphasis of the mission to the family. To where? Amen. To where? Amen. Good to see you, Dr. Anderson. We, we, we are saying now that the mission of the church cannot be carried out in a weak family. That the family is the foundation of society. That this church, CPC, is only as strong as its families. Did I hear you say Amen. And therefore, in the second service, I'm dealing with this family concept under the heading, I will put enmity. Today, they will hear sermon two. Today, your series will be entitled, The Marriage of Adam and Eve, sermon one. Then there'll be sermon two, and sermon three, and sermon four. There's seven sermons. The marriage of Adam and Eve. I, I, I want us, uh, Keith and Gemma, Jennifer, to, 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 to look at old texts in a fresh way and to recognize that what happened in Eden is still affecting us today. That both the successes and the failures of the first couple are hanging over us either like sunshine or like clouds. There's not a person sitting here today who's not affected by what happened in the Garden of Eden. You do know that, don't you? Amen. And if you don't know it, that's the truth. So I want to go back there, Trisant, and look at it, this first marriage. And, 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 and I'm, going to be focusing, I'm going to be focusing, Andrew, on, on the love aspect. On the love aspect. Because I, you, you may say today you're in love, but I can guarantee you that that there are few people on planet Earth who know anything about love. Amen. We're trying at it. But we have become so corrupted by selfishness and sin. Few human beings know anything about love. And that's why we have so many messed up marriages and messed up homes. Because we marry not knowing how to love. Well, I'll say amen for you. Amen. 
You may not want to say amen because you're sitting next to your spouse. I'll say it. Amen. Few people marry knowing how to love. And I know that because I counsel your marriages. Few. And we bring this, we bring this, we bring this baggage of self. Stand before a preacher. And say vows. In many cases, telling lies. And think because we've reached a certain age, we're mature enough to get married. Few people, I'm going to say it again, no apology. Don't come up to me after church and try to correct me. No apology. Few people who marry know anything about love. We think we do. We've watched enough TV and seen enough movies to think we know about love. So these sermons, these seven sermons are not going to be altogether comfortable. But they will be instructive. Let's pray. Help us, Lord. Amen. Let's go back to the mission. Let's go back and reread the mission. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. You got that for me, Richard? Let, 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 let them read the mission with me. This, this, this is the mission. Now stay with me. This is the mission, April, that I'm trying to get you and your husband to see must function in your home. But I'm also going to be showing you all the different Factors that make it difficult for the mission to be carried out in your home. Okay? Let's read together. Go ye. I need to hear you. I need to hear you. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son. This is the mission. Keep reading. Okay. Okay. Far enough. Far enough. Surprise, surprise. That's why you were born. See, some of us think we were born to be doctors or born to be lawyers. Some even think they were born to be married. That's all icing on the cake. This is why you were born. You were born to be a part of the great movement of God to save a planet from sin. That's your main purpose for being alive. Do you understand that? That's why you're born. To go, to teach, to influence. See, some of the things we have on our agenda, things like even like marriage, you know, Jesus already said, there'll be no marrying or giving in marriage in heaven. Boy, it's quiet in the place now. <laughs> See, that, that's just an agenda. That's a hallway. Ultimately, you were born, hallelujah, to be like God. You were born to reflect His image. You were born to carry out it. That's why you were born. All these other things we get so wrapped up in and detached by, distracted by, they're not the main agenda. But we will push God aside in many cases so that these other things can happen. That's why you were born. Then I read this quote. I read this quote last week uh, in, in the second service. Come on, Richard. The stuff in green. Ready? Let's read. Our. Pause. Pause. Wh where does the mission start? Wh wh where do we start reaching out? Wh where do we start teaching people to love? Yeah, at home. At home. Uh, the, 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 the Lord is not concerned about the thousands that Henry Wright has baptized in his ministry if his family is not saved. He's not impressed. Not the least bit. In fact, Terry, he's not going to ask me about one soul baptized. He's going to ask me, where's that family? Did you bring them with you? So this is where it starts. At home, where does it start? Now, you must be asking yourself now, right now, is your family a mission-centered place? Is it a mission-centered place? So, in my sermon last week in the second service, I begin to look at earnest at the origins of the human family, highlighting Satan's attempts. Ladies and gentlemen, every day you're alive, Satan is attempting to prevent your family for, from ever becoming a soul-winning agency. 
See, if you're a married man this morning, your, 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 for, your, your first soul to win to God is your wife. If you're a married woman this morning, your first soul to win to Christ is your husband. So here's a question. Here's a question. Are you a problem to your spouse's salvation? Oh, my. Where did he get that question from? From the Lord. Is your spouse closer to heaven because they're married to you? Now, I understand you're sitting next to you, you know, so you don't want to say anything. Hmm. That's a very important question. But let me put it, see, I, I want to make sure, Kelvin, they got it. I'm going to make it very blunt now. Are you the reason why your spouse is going to hell? Did you have it now? Was that clear? The home is where it starts. The home is where? The home is where? Where it starts. And so we unveil. We begin to unveil. Last week in the second service, Allison, we begin to unveil the key issues. As to see how Satan, with long term... See, Satan understood what God was doing with the family. And so, with long term anticipation, he sought to forever, he sought to forever weaken the human family... By one act of transgression. We, we found out two weeks ago uh, on Men's Day how he worked to diminish men. Brethren, he went after us to diminish men. So, so, we, so we lack that, that, that integrity and vigor that men are supposed to have. But that I also pointed out last week I'm going to review this. He worked to raise questions. To raise what? In the minds of human beings about the God who made the family. Richard, I'm ready for those questions. I want him to see this again. He first wanted human beings to question first. What? What? See, he, he, he wants you to wonder if God knows what he's doing. See, the just shall live by. So if you're full of doubt, if you're full of doubt, you, you can't connect with God. So he raised that question. Secondly, what did he raise? Yeah, first, does he know what he's doing? Then secondly, who's he to be in charge? And some of you and some of us have done this sometimes with our life. There are things that the Bible says don't do. We go on and do it and say, who's God to tell me what to do? I'm grown. Oh, what it is about human beings that makes them think being grown is something? That's a, that, that's a sudden step to intelligence. Some of the most stupid people I've met in my life are. So don't tell me you're grown as a reason why you have a right to do anything. N- uh, number three, he, he, he quest- caused them to do what? He wants you to have a question in your mind as to whether doing right pays off. Let's keep going. Then those questions led to other questions. Come on, Richard. Here we go. They question what? God's holy law. Keep reading. God's intelligence. Keep reading. God's wisdom. God's word. God's justice. God's intentions. God's love. And I pointed out last week that when you question God's love, you question God's existence because the Bible says in 1 John 4, 8, for God is love. You see how deep this gets? Yeah. Very, very deep. So, for the next several mornings, we'll deal with the marriage of Adam and Eve. Let's shift on down now, uh, Richard Washington, and, and let me introduce just two principles today. Just two principles. Just two that I want you to begin to feed on as a foundation for the sermons to come. Go to 1 John 4, 8. 1 John 4 and verse 8. Go there. This is the only text in the Bible. There's only one text in the Bible, and this is it that seeks to define who God is. No other text. Other texts describe him, but no other texts define him. 
1 John 4, 8. Are you there with me? We're reading together. He that... Well, that was, that was ramblingly pitiful. Let's do it together, please. Together. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for... The wording, the wording is just magnificent. It does not say, Glenn, that God loves or that God is loving. Rather, Anthony, it says, for God is love. Oh, my Lord. Now, if, if I'm going to be incisive and linguistically correct, I know that when I see a sentence that has two nouns on either side of a form of the verb to be, those nouns are equal. Ninth grade English. <laughs> For God is love. Therefore, love is godly. Oh. Love is not this romantic foolishness that you see on as the world turns. See, my mom used to, I, I grew up watching. My mom used to watch that. Mom would cry, brother. Cry. And then she'd call her neighbor. Did you see what happened to Sue this morning? They're not going to make it. I thought these people, I'm a boy, I thought these people were real. And I was wondering, where, where do all these people live that have all these problems on TV? It took me a while to understand this was not real. A lot of folk, a lot of folk have made that kind of love real. Now, now, Keith, immediately, uh, Gabrielle, if the Bible says to me, for God is love, therefore love is godly, that suggests to me that love is not just a feeling, it's a principle. See, that's where we run into trouble, sis. We're going on, I love him. Feelings. I feel so strongly about him. But, 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 if, if you study the love of God, he feels strongly about us too. But there's some things he's not going to do. He felt so strongly still, as the Bible declares, he commended the love, love toward us, and that while we were yet enemies, sinners, Christ died for us. That's how he loves. But in spite of that kind of love, he will not accept certain foolishness from you. So love is not some mamby-pamby, you know, I just, you know, I'll just take anything because I'm in love. That's an insult to God. God's a creature of principle. See, so not only is God love, but love is godly. Keep that in mind. That's, that's my first principle. God, love is godly. Love is godly. Love is godly. Love is godly. I want that to seep into your cerebral cortex, down into the convolutions of your brain. I want your synaptic nerve system to receive it. God is love, and love is godly. Now, with this in mind, let's just, let's just pick up a few things about love. Love is what? I want you to get it. Love is what? So, 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 let's study a few things about God's love. Uh, we're going to move fast. Go to move fast. Deuteronomy 7, 8. Now I ask uh, the team, don't, don't print out these texts. Use your Bible. Reading from the confounded screen. Use your Bible. Deuteronomy 7, 8. Deuteronomy 7, 8. Help me if I was in the right book of the Bible. All right. See it? Let's read. Come on. But because the Lord loved you. Ah, 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 ah. See, that's too fast. God is talking now. Read it again. But because the Lord did what? And because he would, which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord with a mighty hand and re out of the house of bondmen from the First, first thing, Daria, God's love is active. Amen. That's right. Amen. Oh, shoot, I thought that was a good point. Right. Yeah. God's love is active. See, see, if you tied up with somebody who's always saying they love you and they're doing nothing, godly love is active. Does something. 
Simple. But see, we miss that. We get caught up. Oh, she loves me. Okay, what is she doing? We get carried away with the aura of the emotion, the essence of the feeling. But, but, but real love, come on somebody, real love does something. And in this case, God's love, God's love redeemed us. See, I ask the question. I've got to come back to it. I'm sorry, folks. I keep... Is the person who's saying they love you, is their love for you redemptive? Is their love saving you? See, even some of you folk who have children and you got your kids, you know, doing every Tom, Dick, and Harry thing they want to do. And you talk about how much you love your children. Love says no. No, you, no, you can't do that. No, uh-uh, not here. Yeah, that's, that, that was my mom's kind of love. Yeah. No, mm, not here. Not in my house. Yeah, mom would say that. Not in my house. So this, this love that's full of all this kind of foolish tolerance. Well, I, you know, I don't, I, he's, he's, he's little, he's just, he's just finding himself. No, you help him find himself. <laughs> Assist him in the search. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 so love is what? Active. What is it? Talk to me. What is it? Number two, number two. We have to move along here because there's quite a few texts. Jeremiah 31 3. Jeremiah 31 3. See, watch, they're using their Bibles. <laughs> 31 3. Hurry up. I'm there. Yeah. You've got to use your Bible you're familiar with. You know exactly where in the, in the, in the, in the, in the you know, the, yeah, the, yeah, put your finger. That's right, Branch. That's right. Verse 3, 31 3, Jeremiah. Everybody's reading. The Lord. I need to hear you. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have done what? Therefore, second point, God's love is everlasting. Now, now everybody naturally always says amen. Like, yeah, amen. But you know, what is that really saying? See, you, you, you need to understand that even the folks that burn in hell, God loves them. See, I, I knew you wouldn't say a lot of amen to that. Because you've been having trouble with that. Let me explain it to you. God loves sinners too much to make them spend eternity with somebody they don't love, namely himself. And because God, listen to the pastor, because Herschel, God is love, that it means he will hurt over every lost person for eternity. You'll be walking around all tears wiped from your eyes, happy as a lark, but God will still be hurting over every person who does not live. Everlasting love. Everlasting love. The agape love. The love that loves because something exists. And something is there. So you have to be very careful about people whose love wanes based on how you act. See, they had a hard time saying amen to that. Because most folks think that if you act unloving, I have a right not to love you. Supposing God took eyesight away from you every time you sin. You know how you'd come to church this morning? Supposing God took hearing from you every time you act unlovable. John, we'd be in bad shape. Most of us would be deaf right now. Amen. Can I get a witness? Amen. And those of us involved, see, remember, these marriages you form are more than just, just opportunities for you to enjoy somebody. These marriages that you formed were formed that you might create a home that will be a salvation center for God. So if you're tied up with somebody uh, who, 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 whose love and kindness toward you wanes and increases as you please them, you are in a mess, not in a marriage, you're in a mess. Amen. Everybody has bad days. In fact, I got, a, I got news for you. I got news for all the married people. <laughs> There's no such thing as two people loving each other equally each day. 
ain't going to happen. Because we're imperfect. Isn't that true? So every day of your marriage, one of you is doing more loving than the other. Now somebody wants to jump up and say, it's me, it's me, I'm the one, I'm the one, I'm the one. Yeah, I know I'm the one. Well, that's your problem. What I'm informing you is, the facts of life are, no two people love each other equally every day. And that's why, that's why you've got to get tied up with somebody who's mature. Amen. Who understands that sometimes they've got to carry the load. Because people have bad, don't people have bad days? If you've had a bad day in your life, raise your hand. All human beings have bad days. And on that day, you probably don't have the capacity to do much loving. So that's the day you need to be loved by somebody. <laughs> you should see your faces. You should see your faces. I love you, though. I really do love you. Romans 5, 8. Third thing about love. I may not finish this today, but that's all right. I'll finish it some other time. You know me. I'd rather teach you good than teach you fast. Amen. Romans 5, verse 8. Come on. Come on. Let's read. Now this, 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 this is one of the most powerful texts in the entire Bible. No text I know of, Scott, expresses God's love like this text. Romans 5, 8. You see it? Will you join me in reading it? But God commendeth his love toward us in that... The Greek says, while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Uh, my point is, third point is, love is self-effacing. That means love puts itself second. Uh, think about it this way. Think about it this way. Before there was a sin, and before there was a sinner, and before planet earth was created jesus had already committed himself to change himself for our sakes did i hear you say amen love puts itself second be very careful of relationships where you're always having to put the other person first and they never put you first be careful of relationships where you're so afraid if you don't do what they want, you're going to lose them. Amen. You'd be better off without them. In fact, you've already lost them because they think nothing of you. Is this plain talk? Is this too strong? It's the truth anyhow. If you're scuffing around the house, always trying to make this person happy, and they're making efforts for you, you're in a terrible situation. And then they bless you with a little kindness every now and then because you've been a good person Amen. doing what they want. Yeah. Now I have a word for that. But it's not permissible in the sanctuary. Amen. I'll put it this way, that's slavery in disguise. God Philippians. Philippians says, He who thought it not robbery to be equal with God made himself of no reputation. He made himself a nobody that I might become somebody in Jesus Christ. That's love. Self-effacing. Love says what you need is what I'm going to do. Not what I need. What you need. Nothing convenient about becoming a savior. Nothing convenient about a cross. Nothing convenient about living for 33 years and don't own a piece of property. Nothing convenient about that lifestyle. But that's what Henry needed me to do. And even if he doesn't have sense enough to know it, I'll still do it for him. Did I hear the church say amen? So love is self-effacing. Number four. Number four, oh my, oh my. First John 3, 1. Quickly, First John 3, 1. We can get into a few more. I can tell you now, we're not going to finish. That's all right. Just love me anyhow. First John 3, 1. Now this is powerful here. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, these texts. These this, this wonderful text. Watch this, Brother Bogans. Look here. First John 3, 1. You got it? Read, 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 read. Behold, pause, pause, pause. What matter of what? 
John now, see, John is the one who, who lived with his, with his, with his head on, on the chest of Jesus. He, he loved, they were close. He just, he, in, fact, in fact, the Bible describes John as the disciple whom Jesus loved. They were just like this. So John understood Christ in a way no other human being did. And he writes, behold, what manner of love. John is saying, this thing is beyond expression. What is he talking about? Keep reading. The Father hath bestowed upon us. What did the Father do? Keep reading. I I, I can't get beyond the phrase that we're called the sons of God. Jacob, God's love is inclusive. It's what? Wraps around everybody. Stay with me, the pastor. Now, stay with me. This is the reason why the devil, infu- uh, 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 the, the, the devil invented things like racism, classism. Come on, y'all. To defeat Brother Banfield, to defeat the concept that God's love is inclusive. We human beings have divided ourselves by everything you can imagine. People who drive the Lexus must be better than people who drive the Focus. And the advertisement industry does this to our brains. If you wear custom-made suits, that's a better suit than a suit bought at, bought at Target. And, and, then, and, then, and then to please our egos, we, we do things to our neighborhoods, you know. Uh, where, where do you live? So-and-so heights. Heights. So-and-so estates. And we say the word estate like that separates us from all mankind. I live in the estates. Don't you live on Brown Street. I live in so-and-so estates. Can I get a witness? And we get, and we get plugged up with this kind of foolishness. Dividing our... In fact, in fact, Paul was so disgusted with what he said in 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and verse 10. He said, he said, we're foolish, dividing ourselves amongst ourselves, comparing ourselves with ourselves. Then he says, those who do so are not wise. Amen. Yeah. 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 True love is inclusive. Amen. Only God, Sonia, knows who's better than somebody else. And we do this even in the church, you know, we, we, uh, it really upsets me, you know, talking about, well, you know, pastor, right, you, you're one of the great preachers. Only God knows Amen. whether I'm a great preacher. Amen. There may be some Joe Blow over there who's got two members, yeah. but working hard every day, whom God calls great and thinks of me as nothing. Yeah. So the, God looks on the inward appearance. We start matching people by the, so, 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 you know, so, so, so Jake's must be just. Last time I read the Bible, T.D. Jakes is going to be measured by the same standard as the homeless person in D.C. But we, not us, we, we even the church, we've gotten caught up in this comparative religion and we've destroyed ourselves so we clique off with those people in the church that are like us. And then we measure each other by bloodlines. Bloodlines. I, you know, my, my family goes back six generations. That's six generations of sin. I mean, what are we bragging about here? Trace me all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. So what? He was a deist, didn't believe in God at all. Now what? Oh, you're back, Jefferson. Okay, okay. Now what? John said, don't worry about it. Why, John? You may not even know who your grandpa is, but you are called a son of God. His love is included. It's wrapped everybody up in one package. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. God's love is inclusive. Hallelujah, Jesus. And we've got to learn to be like that in this church, don't we? I said we've got to learn to be like that in this church, don't we? Yeah, inclusive love. Inclusive love. Inclusive love. Well, I can squeeze in one more. Oh, 
Oh, this is beautiful. First John 4, 19. We're right there in the book, so go over there. Oh, <laughs> little text, but this thing is powerful. This thing is powerful, David. First John 4, 19. You ready? Let's read. What did God do first? Yeah, my, my, my point is God's love makes the first move. If you're tied up with one of these people <laughs> when things get rough in the house and you're always one who has to say, I'm sorry first. See how quiet it is in here, Steele? Because see, they, they sit next to their spouses just like you are. And, and, and they don't want to, they, somebody wanted to say, Amen! But they, they kept themselves cool. They kept it down. Because that stepped right where they live. They said to themselves, I'm always the one. Got to say I'm sorry first. God's love goes up to the member that offended me and apologizes to them that I did anything that might cause them to want to act that way. Even if they don't say boo. Even if they act like I should have come. Now they did me in. But the arrogant rascal acts like I should have come. Well I wonder when he's going to come make things straight. And the devil is saying you ought to take your fist and rearrange their teeth. Don't sit there quiet. You know the devil puts thoughts like that in your head. Amen. I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to thrust it all the way through to the back of their neck. You know things like that come in your mind. Come on and say it. Let it out. Let it out. You know you get thoughts like that. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. That's why some of us have so little left because we've been giving our pieces out for all our life. <laughs> Stay with the pastor. I make you smile purposely to lighten this load. True love. True love, Sharon, goes first. Goes first. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would declare unto you there would have never been a war on planet Earth if that principle was followed. I'm sorry. Whatever I can do to make... I'm sorry. First. Do we sit down and justify ourselves... I ain't done nothing. I know I ain't done nothing. They got a problem with me. It's their problem. Have you ever read Matthew 5, 23 and 24? Have you read that text? If you get to the altar, Jesus said, I wish he wouldn't put things like this in the Bible. If you get to the altar and remember there that your neighbor has ought against you. It didn't say if you have ought against them. I tell you, Jesus is such a nuisance. He says, if they have, in other words, he makes me responsible for their pain. Don't come to me saying, I'm fine. I'm not upset. I'm fine. They're upset. I'm praying for them. Jesus, what are you doing here? What are you doing at my altar? Go find that person who's upset. I'm making you responsible for their pain, though you have no pain Oh, my Lord. He said, Pastor, I thought your subject was the marriage of Adam and Eve. It sure is. I'm letting you see what in one bite of fruit the devil destroyed. Adam and Eve's capacity to love. And that's why we see him standing in Genesis 3.12 abandoning his spouse. I heard that voice. I was afraid. I hid myself. She's standing there. He doesn't even even include her in the explanation. And then when God asked him, how did you get in this mess? The woman whom thou gavest to me. I don't know how long they've been married at that time. Maybe one day, maybe two weeks, maybe one month. But he shoved it to Eve that day. Love flew out the window. They had been made in the image of God. They had been made full of love, full of the capacity to love. And that quick one sin 
And that's why the greatest deterrent to your living the sermon I preach today is selfishness. Are you with me today, folk? All right, I've got to finish this next go-around. I'll finish this next go-around. But we're dealing now with the marriage of Adam and Eve. We're dealing now with what the devil did to make it difficult for your home to be a mission center. Your head are bowed. Heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Father, forgive me for not finishing, but you know my, my, my burden, and you've given me so much in these sermons, so much. I can hardly handle it. Bless these precious dear ones. I've watched their faces. They've listened well today. I'm proud of them. They've listened well. They're, they're, they're following their pastor. And our hunger today, Lord, our hunger today is to learn to love. Our hunger today is not to use that word so fast anymore. Our hunger today is for you to restore your image full of love in us. Give us the phileo, the agape, the eros, the phileo. Give it all to us. Fill us with love. We trust that this week's message has truly been a blessing. If you have any questions about the message or would be interested in additional Bible studies, please let us know. You may do this by selecting the Contact Us link on our homepage. From there you can send an email to Pastor Willie Boyd. Now feel free to share this message with a friend and remember to check back with us next week for another featured message.